31, welcome to example 9. We're going to take a look at compound interest and we're going to hone in on a very specific type of savings account. And there are many types of savings accounts out there. I'm going to talk about one particular kind that is governed by this formula. And you may or may not have this type of savings account. I'll tell you for me personally, I don't. But I have a different savings account and it has a different formula that goes with it. But I, I want to talk about this type of savings account. So let, let's read through this. It says if P dollars are deposited in an account paying an annual rate of interest R compounded N times per year, then after T years the account will contain A dollars according to this formula. Okay, so we got a lot of letters. We actually have five of them. We have A, we have P, we have R, we have N, and we have T. So there are five variables in here. All right, so this first one, it says if P dollars are deposited into an account, you will frequently hear this referred to as principal. All right, so this type of savings account is when you make a one-time deposit. You put a chunk of money into a savings account and you let it sit for however many years you feel like letting it sit. Um, this might be a trust fund. Uh, or maybe um, a grandparent passes away when you're younger and they leave you a chunk of money in their will and your parents deposit that into a savings account and they leave it there until you turn 18 and you get that money back when you turn 18. That type of account is governed by this formula. So we're going to make an initial deposit of P dollars. All right. We're going to get an annual interest rate of R percent. Now usually R is told to you as a percent and and we have to work with it as a decimal so I want to talk about I'm going to take a little side story here and talk about interest rates so for my personal savings account the one I have at B of A I have a terrible interest rate it's at about 0.5 percent all right and I don't know what if you guys have savings accounts if you know what your interest rates are but my interest rate's been really really low especially since there was the the crash in 2008, interest rates have just been super low and they haven't really recovered. So why that's bad is because inflation runs at about 3 to 4 percent per year. Somewhere in there. And actually I'll, I'll say inflation's also been a little low since the recession, but historically it's around there. But let's say, let's even be generous, let's say inflation was 3 percent, okay? And it, again, it might be a little low, it might be like 2%. You guys are the business majors, you'd need to look it up. I'm, I'm not current on it. But what that means is whatever I pay, uh, whatever I can buy with a dollar this year, it would cost me like a dollar and three cents next year. So the value of my dollar, it gets less and less powerful. I can't buy as much with a dollar as time increases. And inflation would be okay if my savings account could beat it. But if I keep money in my savings account and only gain 0.5% in interest and inflation is higher than that interest rate, then I'm actually losing money by keeping my money in my savings account. And you might say, well, then why even have a savings account? Well, there's different types of savings accounts out there. And some of them, like I have a retirement account because I work at Chabot. They made a retirement account for me, which is awesome. My retirement account actually gets like 6% interest. Um, so it actually beats inflation. The only problem is I'm about 25 years away from retiring, so I'm not going to see that money anytime soon. So again, good. And I'm not trying to complain, just telling you how, how all these savings accounts can work out for you. All right, but that being aside, whatever your interest rate is, if it's written as a percent, when you plug it into this formula, make sure you write it as a decimal. So if we were talking about my personal savings account, it would be 0.005. If for some reason you were talking about inflation, you would say 0 0.03 or 0 0.04. All right, now you can get interest paid to you n times per year. In my personal savings account, I get interest paid to me once a month, so n would be 12. And the more often you can compound interest, the more often you get paid in your interest, the better for you because you begin to earn interest off of your interest. And that um, helps out with exponential growth that contributes to it. All right, if you've got interest getting paid out n times per year and you keep your money in there for t years, you will eventually have a dollars. All right, so this is your starting amount, this is your finishing amount, this is your interest rate, this is the number of times you get interest, and this is the number of years you have that account open. 
All right, five variables. How these problems typically work out is I will give you four of those variables and you're gonna need to solve for the fifth one. So let's read through example nine and see if we can spot which of these five letters I gave you and which one I'm asking you to find. So an initial investment of $100,000 at 12% interest is compounded weekly. What will the investment be worth in 30 years? Now you can tell this is a made up problem. I do not have $100,000. I have never heard of a 12% interest account. That would be fantastic. I would love to find a savings account that gave me interest every week. So all of these things are totally imaginary, but let's see how much money I would have if I started with $100,000 and found these all, all these ideal situations, 12% interest, compounded weekly, and I could leave it there for 30 years without worrying about it. All right, our first number. This is our initial investment, or it's our principal. So we would say here that P is 100,000, okay? You see my interest rate here, that's my R, but you wanna be careful, when you enter R in for your formula, you need to write it as a decimal. Now here I'm being told I'm compounding interest weekly. All right, when you compound interest weekly, you're gonna get interest 52 times in a year, so N is going to be equal to 52. All right, and then we see this last one here of 30 years, well that's a time value. So you can see in this problem I flat out gave you P, R, N, and T. And it says, what will the investment be worth in 30 years? So what is the ending amount? What is my A value? Well, it's just a matter of plugging in. So I know A will be equal to my principal, and then we've got one plus R over N to the NT. Now I want you to take note of the exponential growth in here. Do you see my equilibrium, my, my starting base of one, but I'm adding something positive to it. Right, this is going to be exponential growth. And I say exponential growth because we've got our, our variable, our main variable time up in the exponent. So this will be equal to 1,000, excuse me, 100,000 times one plus 0.12 over 30 to the 52 times 30. Okay. Now if we go one step further, I wanna show you what that base is. So we'll take our equilibrium of 1, we'll add 0.12 to it, divide by 52, and I'm looking at a base of about 1.002. So this is 100,000 times 1.002, and let's see what 52 times 30 is. We are looking at 1,560. All right. Now I just want to chat about this a little bit. We're going to start with 100,000 and each time out we're going to gain, each year out we're going to gain about, uh, not each year, excuse me, each week we're going to gain about 0.2%. And because I'm going to leave it in there for 30 years and we've got 52 weeks per year, I'm going to be getting interest about 1,560 times. Not even about, exactly. Now. It's up to you how you want to crunch this. I want to show you that exponential growth, and for that matter, exponential decay, it's really susceptible to um, decimal round off. And let me show you what I mean by that. If I was going to enter into my calculator 100,000, and then we'll do our base of 1.002 to the 1,560, you see that I wind up with about, mm, 2.2 million, right? So two million two hundred fifty-seven dollars five hundred. Excuse me, two million two hundred fifty-seven thousand five hundred ninety-two dollars and sixty-eight cents. So let me write that down. Which, before I go into the rest of this, that ain't too bad. I would love to have two point two million in 30 years. I'm just falling short of that because I don't have $100,000 now and I will never find a 12% interest account. Now, I want to show you the decimal round off because I approximated this base with the decimal 1.002. I want to show you what happens if you use the exact value. I want you to see the discrepancy in these answers. So here's what I mean. If instead of 1.002, I did 100,000 times 1, plus 0.12 divided by 52, right? I don't, 
I don't use 1.002, I use the original problem, and I raise it to the 1560 power. Do you see what a difference that non-decimal or that non-rounded answer makes? Look, now I'm getting $3,644,675.88. So we've got $3,644,675.88. And I would much sooner have this much money as opposed to that much money. And this is the correct answer because I don't have a decimal round off error. I just wanted to show you how susceptible these exponential functions are to decimal round off. Because exponential functions grow so quickly, the sooner you round your digits, right, the sooner I round, the more likely I am to have an error on the back end. So I usually float my decimals. I don't round off any part of my problem until the bitter end, till I'm at my final answer. All right, so with that, we're gonna try this again in example 10. I'll see you in a bit, bye.